Thank you for joining us live from the New York Stock Exchange for the Simplify Entering the Fall Thought Leadership Series. My name is Eric McArdle, uh, referred to as the dumbest guy in the room at Simplify. <laughs> joining us today is Michael Campos of Betterment, Dan McMurdy of Tyros, and my buddy Dave Burns, CIO and co-founder of Simplify Asset Management. Guys, thanks for joining us today. Good Thank to be here. Having us. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome, glad to be here. Nice to be able to do this in person, right? Yeah, sure is. Indeed. So we've got a wide variety of panelists. We're going to talk about a wide variety of asset allocation topics, specifically in line with the modern environment that we are in, right? And looking forward to how do we build portfolios, not only for today, but for tomorrow. And I want to start with you, Michael. We're really spoiled as investors to have a wide variety of investment choices today, almost to the point where it's a little overwhelming. How do you, and, and how does Betterment, for example, view this wide array or this wide menu of offerings and putting the pieces together? Um, I, I mean, I would say, you know, dealing at Betterment where we deal, uh, you know, it's 80, 90% of our business is retail investors, unsophisticated investors. I wouldn't necessarily say that the wide variety of options is necessarily an advantage right now. And um, it's a lot there. You have a lot of investors who just, um, you know, it's a lot of investors who don't like doing their own research, want to like basically consume all the information on their phone, right? Mm -hmm. They're used to places like Robinhood, right? That that can, you know, for all of my you know, pet peeves about Robinhood. What I will say about Robinhood is that they do a phenomenal job with their user experience in getting people invested quickly. Do I think that they're necessarily being responsible? No, absolutely not. But I mean, our challenge is from a betterment side, like being a fiduciary, being an advisor, like how do I get these people into diversified portfolios and make it exciting? And at the same time, like, how do I keep these users engaged and retained on our platform, right? Because, you know, like any tech company, we, we see a whole lot of people come and go, right? And, you know, th they come, they might give you an initial set of money, but then they leave, they get bored and, and um, want to go to uh, a Robinhood or another, you know, say more exciting platform, right? Um, and so it, it's very hard, that education aspect is very hard. And like, you know, it's, it's with a more exciting, in, you know, ETFs where we can potentially kind of engage people more, but that's still, to be honest, a little bit more of a challenging area for us because not only do you have to say, okay, it's a little more exciting, whether it's the thematic funds or, or, or whatnot, but it, it's just, it's like to, um, to get somebody into these funds and to be able to explain what you're actually investing in, in a very, you know, limited, amount of time, you know, given really short attention spans, it's, it's actually, it's a pretty challenging thing. And this is why, this is why, you know, tech companies have product designers, product managers trying to figure out what that user experience looks like. I mean, so that's, that, that's pretty much kind of what I see day to day. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to pull on the thread of user experience a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important, and I'll even go as far as saying essential in today's environment to have all of your ducks in a row in terms of marketing, product appearance, the ability to communicate your value prop. Can you come into the investment product landscape today with, you know, quite frankly, any of those pieces missing and being, be successful? I would say that definitely not. And like, because even places like BlackRock, right, are getting better at it. Places like Goldman Sachs Asset Management are getting better at it, right? They do a bunch of stuff that they do it better than we do, right? And it's like so. It's like as a new investing company, like that's that's very tech driven. That that's absolutely table stakes. Yep, that makes sense. Now, Dan, you work with typically higher net worth individuals, accredited investors, often you know um, institutional allocators. Do those same threads kind of apply to when you're telling stories, or how, how does that look for you? I think it's changing. I think generally. We have a much more private model. You know, there's no app, there's no uh, mobile app. Certainly, uh, there's no. You know, nothing about our business is fast. It's a very long sales cycle. We usually get to know people over 
minimum six, but up to 24, 36 months before we have a partnership. And then we're trying to pitch an investment strategy that is designed to work over a three to five year period. So we're trying to deliberately slow everything down. And actually, we're trying to deliberately filter people out of the sales funnel because unless we can predetermine that they have that patience, we're not going to be able to implement our investment program. And so I think one of the issues you have when you see a lot of these new models coming in is that you know, stated versus revealed preferences are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this a lot where you know, simply by us slowing down our, essentially our sales process and the dating process, you watch people who will say one thing in the first meeting and by the third meeting have a completely different tune. And I think just in the last 18 months, you've seen enormous shifts in risk appetite month to month. I mean, February of 2020, nothing could go wrong. We're going to the moon forever. Uh, March of 2020, the world's ending. April of 2020, how could you not have gone 100% long in the S&P, you idiot? <laughs> and we heard this not just from retail investors, but from very sophisticated mm -hmm. institutional mm -hmm. investors. I, you know, we had people, we had an individual crying on the phone who the next month was shouting on the phone. We saw you know, crazy emotional swings there. And so we're trying to actually basically build up frictions and take a longer term perspective because we don't think we can add value to our end customer by playing around in those games. And you know, we think that we are going to miss a lot of exciting short-term things. And we think that's precisely why we can offer value to our customers over a long period of time. But we have to build in a deliberately slow, deliberately somewhat boring process. And so we communicate primarily via emailed PDFs. Um, and the other thing we do is we view technology as a way to essentially scale up your ability to do old school, high touch, you know, white glove service. And so we like to have dinners and events and have people meet each other, serve as a little bit of a value-add connector of people. There's a lot of things that we see that are not relevant to our stated investment strategy, so we share that with our partners. We collaborate with them on a lot of things that we're not managing. Um, and that's the way we kind of maintain those relationships. I'd say the majority of the conversations we have with our existing partners have nothing to do with the current portfolio. It's about what they're interested in, what their goals are, how we can help. And that's, that's really our business, is trying to kind of run a almost an old school social club augmented with all these, these digital tools. And as you guys may know, I'm a big Twitter guy. So a lot of times I'll have somebody who's a little bit older in the family office circle who says, hey, I want to meet this TikTok person. First of all, what's a TikTok and who is this person? <laughs> and I can help kind of adjudicate that process. Um, so that's, that's kind of how my business works. But it's, it's very much the opposite, because I do think it's getting more competitive, and I don't think I can compete at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to hit on something you mentioned. You know, the, I think the fickle nature of investors, right? What have you done for me lately is something that I, I think about a lot when talking to allocators. And Dave, I know you've done a lot of work on client behavior, client risk preferences. How much of that goes into informing decisions as a portfolio construction process? And further, do you find yourself bending to the will of the client when it comes to making the investment decisions? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a balance. You wanna keep investors committed to the plan, right? So you wanna get their risk profile right. That's a huge part of doing that. But then at the same time, you also have to be honest with yourself about, you know, is the client gonna be focused on their neighbors and keeping up with the Joneses? And <clears throat> do you have to bring in, um, do you have to you know, minimize tracking error, just some benchmark like the Joneses next door, right? <laughs> um, so you, you just, you want to put your best foot forward, try to get client into a portfolio that they can really stick with um, by really unpacking exactly who they are. And that can take a few years to really get to know your client. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure at, at Betterment, Michael deals with this all the time uh, and has his own perspectives on it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because when you're dealing, it's so challenging to deal with this problem at scale, right? And, yeah. and it's... Um, going back to a little bit of what Dan was saying earlier, where like it's figuring out those customers, your you know the high intent customers, right? When you're operating at that scale, it's super hard to figure out. You have to, you know, you, you have to run you know split tests, A/B tests, where you launch different user experiences for you know different set of users to see, hey, if I propose a user experience this way, can I? find my high intent users that way. You have to do a lot of user interviews, right? And like, and ultimately it's all about like, you know, I have this product, I need, you know, you need to have your tar target user in mind and you have to get that right. And if you do not get that right, the product basically fails. 
So anyway, so it's like it's just kind of interesting, kind of like hearing you know the both of you talk and and like you know you having to focus on a very specific group, right? And 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 for me, that's a little bit harder to do, right? To yeah. just kind of operating hundred percent. Yeah, it's way easier to do for a single client. Right, you can meet with them personally and really try to get get behind the curtain there. But to do that on mass for tens of thousands yeah. of accounts, I mean, that sounds. Yeah, really hard problem. And and I would say for a lot of fintech firms that do kind of this robo advisor thing, that's kind of the holy grail, right? How do I recreate that kind of one to one experience in a mobile app? Yeah. Right. And I, you know, no one is. I haven't seen anyone be able to do that yet. What yeah. do you think of businesses like Red Holtz and others that are creating? Yeah, I think that's an interesting business model to me because they are essentially running a media business mm -hmm. to both attract and I think I wouldn't say distract, but entertain clients mm -hmm. them through. Because if you're going to watch Josh Brown and Michael Batnick pal around for an hour, yep, 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 it creates that familiarity. It maybe I, I think it maybe keeps people on plan a little bit more. Do you, th you have any thoughts on people building media businesses attached to this type of stuff? Uh, I mean, I think it generally it's. It's a pretty good idea because it's a really good way of keeping people engaged. I mean, investing for most people is fundamentally a super boring thing, right? Right. You know, nobody wants to hear about you know passive index funds, right? In fact, you know, I've been working really hard at Betterment to move the the, the language of passive completely from from all of our communications because you, know, you use passive and like you know everyone thinks that you're doing nothing, right? And we charge 25 basis points per year. So like, you know, you use passives and you know, people start asking, what am I hiring you for, right? But like, I, it, but sorry, I, I digress. But like, it's just it, having that way of, of getting a customer hooked and keeping them engaged, I think is so important. I'm not saying it's an easy problem to solve. I don't know if media is the, or video or, or, or what is the only way to do it. But I mean, I think that can be a very important part of, of any um, uh, uh, fintech uh, mobile app experience. So I have a question about this. And you know, we're talking about content creation mm -hmm. and being able to add on top of your existing brand with you know, additional value adds. And, and really, the term that comes to mind here is storytelling. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of conversation around narratives today, and narratives really being kind of at the core of understanding markets, right? Whether you're talking about the meme or whether you're talking about, you know, even speaking with younger gener uh, generation old investors through Twitter. How important is storytelling when it comes to your process? And Dan, I'll start with you on this. I think it's everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's people, I've yet to meet a single investor that invests purely on data from an allocation perspective. Mm. They might, within a given bucket, given sub-strategy, once they've already made this high-level thing, they might then make some database decisions. But even then, there's so many social frictions throughout the chain, whether wherever the actual capital source is. The, there's usually a committee who's involved in that that, is, that are not investment professionals. They are very, very biased towards narrative. David Einhorn was on stage earlier today, and essentially what he's describing is layers of social costs which have caused potentially long-term disruptions and a lot of basic materials things. And also the, the dynamic at the company board level where they can't justify making the investments that, from a societal perspective, you would argue need to be made. Um, but the returns just don't make sense. So I think even if you, you know, are going to make a data-oriented pitch, you need you know, the data is kind of this front story, and then you need a story of why the data is what it is. Mm. Um, and I think data just comes down to ease of transmission of information. Now, people can always tell a narrative easier they can transmit mm -hmm. numbers. And the, and the benefit of a narrative is whether the audience is technical or not, a narrative can move through. Data can really only work with a very small subset of kind of highly sophisticated LPs. Um, and, and you know, for us, you know, I have a different system because we, we deal with about 50 partners. And most of them are family offices and some institutions, foundations, and things like that. And, they want to know what they invested in and what we're doing. And so they want to hear narratives about the actual individual investments, as well as the narratives about our internal firm and our process and what we're learning and what we're doing and how we're improving. Um, and they also want to hear what we think of the other narratives in the market. And so you know, we essentially deal in narratives. And what we're trying to find, ultimately, as an individual stock picker, is significant differences between data and narratives. And when we figure out what's going to cause those to realign, that's when we make an investment. So we're, we're primarily in the narrative business. 
are you willing to tell a story that's unpopular in the present day? If it means achieving a greater goal three years, five years out? No. <laughs> um, I, I, I realize I should say yes, but I, uh, I'm willing to structure my portfolio in a way that might imply I believe a narrative that's unpopular, but I don't, I've never seen that be effective. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather something happen that I, like, you know, going into COVID, we hedged our portfolio. We are a supply chain focused fundamental firm. We saw China shut down. We thought, we thought that we had no idea what the virus was going to do, but we knew that if China was shutting entire provinces, that it was bigger than people thought. So we hedged the portfolio. At that point in time, a few people that I called and talked about it, most of them said, yeah, there's a SARS thing in China every X, Y, Z years. You just don't get it. It's not a big deal. You know, uh, it, it was not productive for me to do that. And I was very much within my mandate to hedge the portfolio. And I didn't go massively short the, port short the market. But if you recall, vol was about 10 at the time. So it was very inexpensive to do it. I thought it was inoffensive and, and asymmetric to, to hedge. So I did. And then I kind of asked forgiveness what, when I had you know, the P&L to do it. And I didn't risk very much capital. But I don't think you want to do that. I, I think that one of the things that several people have talked about today off stage has been you know, being at an optimal portfolio is obviously optimal. But you need a behaviorally sur for survivable investment program. And so I really want, I need to, I need to re maintain rapport with my partners and with all of my stakeholders. And I'm happy to kind of tilt into what I think is actually a suboptimal portfolio if I think we're going to get a better end result by actually, because we can adhere to that. Whatever plan you can stick to is the best plan. That's always the thing that's tough is I don't know really anyone who runs an optimal portfolio. Um, so we, we've kind of given up that idea. And we try to think about it in terms of how do we minimize the number of exogenous shocks we're exposed to. Um, and I, I think a lot of times you can take maybe an unpopular narrative and you can repackage it into a conversation of, do we really need to have 150% of your net worth long three tech stocks? Is that really your goal here? Um, and if you want to do that, why don't we take a sleeve of your capital and let you just go absolutely ham on some SaaS stocks? Like, that's fine. But let's think about what the actual goal here is. And, and that's one of the things that's fascinating in the crypto space right now is it's one thing to believe in crypto. It's another thing to gamble your family's permanent financial outcome on crypto. Those are actually very, very different <laughs> things. but it's very cognitively similar when you have conviction. So we always try to dial back conviction and think rationally and approach it that way. And we, we really, again, want to self-select for partners where that is a, a kind of amiable conversation. There are certainly people where you know, to question their faith is unspeakable, and we just don't, generally don't work with those people, or at least don't work with them very long. Smart. <laughs> Dave, I want to turn to you. And you know, we've, we brought up crypto now, so that genie is out of the bottle. When it comes to asset allocation and thinking about what clients are really looking for in terms of you know, not missing out to the upside, right? The, the term often used is FOMO for this, but also are very focused on you know, loss aversion and uh, you know, really preserving the capital that they have in the game. Where do you view crypto in today's portfolio? Yeah, so it's simplified. We took it serious once the global, once it reached 1% in the global market portfolio. I mean, that's, you, you, you got to take it seriously there, right? Um, and, and we want advisors to be able to give their clients what they want, right? To stay the course, the whole Joneses thing. Um, so if you can provide the exposure in a risk managed way um, and not have your clients being 100, 150% long in it, keep them in the five, 10 percent or less range, um, I think that can make a lot of sense. You know, it's that, it's that balance behind between optimal efficient frontier and a behaviorally optimized portfolio that the client's really going to stick with. Do you find that there is a number in terms of allocation that is too small? I mean, I, I think in any portfolio, given your um, error bars in optimization and constructing portfolios, those can be in like the 5 to 10% mm -hmm. range. Mm -hmm. So if you're really being honest around your line items, uh, I, I think anything below 5%, you've got to really ask yourself if that's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. 
So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I don't want to go entirely down the crypto rabbit hole because I feel like we could spend the rest of the panel talking about that. And uh, for, you, for those of you at home watching on Real Vision, I'm sure you get a lot of crypto content. So let's talk about something you maybe don't consider as much, the 60-40 portfolio, right, which is something that investors, pundits, they like to beat over the head um, in terms of saying, you know, this should be dead, right? So far, they've been wrong. It's generally worked fairly well. Um, that said, we continue to move lower in terms of yields. Uh, if we do believe that you know, the lower bound on rates is zero, we're getting very close to that. That's up for discussion in and of itself. But let's just stay within that framework. The 60-40 makes sense going forward. Michael, to you. Um, I mean, I think at a baseline, it's probably here to stay for sure. Do I think as a fiduciary that that's the box you should stick with? Absolutely not, right? And it's, and it's particularly in a world of uh, you know, interest rates that have been uh, really a bit, uh, low since the, you know, super low since the great financial crisis approaching zero, right? And diversification just isn't going to work in, in, in the same way, right? And um, and you know, if you think about it, there are so many other like if you you know for someone who, who was a hedge fund manager who's done a lot of this research, there's so many other sources of return out there, and you know I think generally speaking, you're not being a responsible fiduciary if you're not uh, letting your clients know what these additional sources of return are because you know you encounter a client who who wants like an eight percent target return, right? Hey, guess what? 60-40 is not going to give it to you. I mean, you could, you know, you, probably not even a 90-10, right? Gets you there, right? You're going to need additional sources of, of return there. So now you, now you have to start thinking about alternatives, uh, options-based, you know, convexity strategies, um, strategies that take on more credit risk, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so it's, um, I think it's, it's really just the responsible thing to do to let your customers know what these other sources of return are, but in a way that where you can explain very clearly where their new sources of risk are, are coming from. And that's a challenge in and of itself, because for, for the world that's used to like, hey, all my risk is determined by equity versus bonds, which is not true, obviously, but like that's what everyone believes, right? Um, that's, so it's a challenge in and of itself to like, if, for people who can't even understand that, right? Now you gotta tell them, the sources of risk associated with, with, with being, um, you know, invested in direct private investments and things like uh, it, the liquidity premium and risks, right? So, right, yeah, you know. right. And so, you know, over the last decade or so, kind of pulling on that you know, narrative or, or, or the story about where yields can only go so low, right? Mm -hmm. This has obviously been a topic that I'm sure other panels have spent mm -hmm. a lot of oxygen on, right? But if you think about the alternative that has been provided for financial advisors in particular, it's been a 50, 30, 20 framework or something of the sorts. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that often in that 20 bucket, investors end up purchasing things they don't understand, mm -hmm. uh, whether through you know, poor disclosure or just having the wrong idea about the behavior of the underlying. And then ultimately they end up being disappointed with the outcome. Mm -hmm. But again, as we have reached this point now where we understand the 40 is challenged, what kind of investments are we seeing in the potential 20 bucket if we were to presume a 50, 30, 20 framework going forward? What do you think, Dan? Uh, you know, I'm extremely biased here, but I think alternatives have a lot to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. Um, I don't know that I agree that 60, 40 is not going to work. I think that... Uh, I'm kind of in the Lacey Hunt camp of thinking that yields and the nominal amount of debt kind of create a little bit of a feedback loop that's problematic. And I don't know that yields can't go significantly negative in the United States. I do think that there then would be a much harder version of this conversation if we're, if we're at negative two, things get really, really weird. Um, but I think you have to put that on the table as a scenario. Um, and I do think in terms of the administrative frictions of putting any of these procedures in place, 60-40 remains a very low friction option. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you're actually, you know, if you care about a return, and especially if you care about a return in a certain manner in terms of volatility or drawdown, I think you have to look elsewhere. And 
you know, there's always a discussion of what's been working recently, which I think is kind of the wrong discussion. Um, because we need to think about, you know, why, why are we having the conversation about the 60-40? We're having the conversation about the 60-40 because of where duration is, where convexity is, yields, et cetera. And so if what we're actually concerned with is a scenario where something strange happens unrelated to that, we need, you know, maybe not even uncorrelated, we might need negatively correlated strategies um, or, or strategies that have different correlation profiles. Um, so it might be time to go back and look at things like CTAs, which have been completely Agreed. out of favor for a very yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think there's a lot of uncorrelated sources of yield that are not extremely scalable. And I think one of the issues there is that I don't know how an advisor really accesses them. In the kind of large family office market, there are a lot of you know, great shops that offer you know, AUMs in kind of the $1 to $5 billion range that offer really esoteric credit products or things like that that are going to reliably generate kind of in the 7 to 12% range. But they're, you know, no one understands what's in them. You, know, you can spend a lot of time, but they're you know, very, very esoteric. And as a manager, I'm friends with him, a fan of him. Neil Berger runs a firm called Eagle View. And he basically exclusively invests in these extremely capacity limited esoteric strategies, like electricity arbitrage and things like that. And those are 50 to $200 million max capacity strategies. And he's got a bunch of them and he structures his portfolio very well, and you know he just puts up very consistent returns. And there's things like that that, you know, if you're a fiduciary and you want to roll up your sleeves, there is stuff to to be done. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be on a bank platform. It's you know you're going to have to go and actually bear those search costs, and you're going to have to do a lot of explaining. And you also really have to have even higher of an understanding of who your client actually is, not necessarily what they're saying, because. Mm -hmm. They're going to look really bad when the S&P rips off, you know, 20% in a six-month period. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Going, why do I own this? Right. If I was you, what I, number one thing I'd want to see is what does my customer's monthly spend at Restoration Hardware look like? If that just hockey sticks, right, right. you know, duck. Um, so, but I think there's a lot of opportunities in 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 alts here. I think it has a really good place in the portfolio. Um, and I'm not as scared as bond, of bonds as other people. But again, I don't know that in most people's position they want to be making that bet. I'm a hedge fund manager, so I'm, I'm very willing to take calculated risks. I don't know that that's really what people are going for with their retirement money. Right. I, I would just add to that, I mean, obviously structured products are really being democratized now, right, in the ETF space. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about diversifying your diversifiers, diversifying from your full 40 bonds and other things like also, which I do agree are, are a great place, um, I would just also really look to the, the, that, that democratization that's happening and look for structured products at low costs that are very efficient, that are now accessible, uh, you know, bro broadly. Mm -hmm. so. and, and the ability to do that at scale, I think, is something that is really important, right? You talked, Dan, about some strategies that are maybe a little bit more capacity constrained. Um, but with the ETF wrapper, you know, we've had a lot of democratization, for lack of a better word, right, of some of these more esoteric strategies. Um, one of the considerations, though, is if we're benchmarking to a 60-40 portfolio or if we're benchmarking to increasingly the S&P 500, Dave, how do you coach clients or advisors to put up with that? Yeah, I think you just got to select the right products. I mean, you, you, you have to be conscious of this tracking error uh, and you have to minimize it to help keep clients uh, invested. Mm -hmm. So I think you just got to be smart about the structured products, the democratized ones that are, that are more liquid. Uh, you got to really consider the fees uh, and exactly what the value proposition is um, and how they're structured. Should portfolio construction be viewed from the ground up? And what I mean by that is when you're putting together this, this puzzle, Investors often tend to look at the individual pieces and assign too much weight to recent performance from, say, a tail hedge strategy or to commodities, right? Dan, you mentioned this earlier where, you know, there's a lot of emphasis kind of at the last quarter or the last 12 months. Do we need to get beyond that in putting together comprehensive, robust portfolios? And what is your firm view on that, Michael? I mean, it's... I think anyone who constructs portfolios, I mean, who doesn't tell you that it's both art and science is lying to you. Um, you, you can start with like, and this is uh, historically what we've just generally done in Betterment, is like, yeah, you think about what the global market portfolio looks like. 
you allocate accordingly, right? You know, using your standard whatever cap M theory, right? And then, um, but then like after that though, it's it's you know you still have to you know do a little bit more work beyond that to to make the portfolio look intuitive, right? And so whether it's running it through your optimizer, constraining the algorithm. Or you know what you know a lot of I think what a lot of like quants do nowadays is they're running these like Monte Carlo simulations. I, you know I think I mean, Corey Hofstein does this to a certain extent, right? To kind of construct you know optimal portfolios under kind of tens of thousands of scenarios, right? Um, but you know in the end though, like you can be as sophisticated as you want, right? But in the end, it all boils down to storytelling. <laughs> How right. many how many line items are generally in your portfolios? I mean, they're all they're all e, they're all ETFs. Yeah, and, and that's like our our broadest portfolio probably has thirteen ETFs 13. in it. Um, okay. um, and then we have we certainly have portfolios that have fewer than that. Keep in mind too that a big selling feature of Betterment is is running tax loss harvesting. Uh -huh. Right. So like um, you obviously want to try and maximize the opportunities around that with, with ETFs, but. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, I mean, in the end, it's like, it, you have to think you kind of intuitively, like, how do I explain this portfolio to the customer, right? And, and at times, you just have to make those subjective decisions, like, I'm going to cap this at this percentage, because that, that's what seems to make sense, and uh, what, um, you know, what, what would make the most intuitive sense to everybody, right? Um, and then beyond that, right, it's like, you want to run through your stress testing scenarios, right? Yeah. And so, like in the end, it's like uh, I agree. Like the, the optimal portfolio, uh, nobody really knows what that is, right? That's all measured with error, right? And um, and it, so, in the end, it's like the best thing you can do is to understand what your potential risks might look like under different scenarios, under different possible events, and hopefully, you can get you can, you can make that clear to your to your clients. It's interesting. There's like a curb appeal feature of your portfolios for your end clients yep. that you have to focus on. Yep. It's really interesting. So it goes like beyond the you know tracking error, minimization yep. or anything, it's just curb appeal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Super interesting. It's like, it's like literally for the client to look at the portfolio and just without really saying anything, say, oh, that makes sense to me, uh -huh. right? So. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. Makes sense. And to your point about having, say, 15 line items, right? I've found that in talking to allocators, it's nice to have multiple players on the field. So if you need to bench one, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And it shows that you are somewhat in control of the situation. Um, sometimes maybe too in, too in control, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. the rebalances occur in the worst possible scenarios, but right. it does give you a better story to tell your clients. Dan, I'm curious, in the hedge fund space, how does that dynamic look for you? Do you have the ability to show what's happening underneath the hood? Or is it more of just, hey, you're here for me, you're here for this, you know, this is it? Um, when you're, I mean, I'm a relatively concentrated investor, we'll have 10%, 15% portfolio positions pretty frequently, sometimes several of them. And so ultimately one of the, one of the conversations that has to happen with what I do is I'm ultimately being paid to absorb the cortisol that the uh, LP does not want to absorb. I get paid to take stress. And so part of that is we can go through and have a, you know, we're very willing to have a reasonable conversation on what's going on. But you don't really want that, actually. Um, and it's, it's, it's usually the, the correlation between people wanting portfolio transparency and people preparing to make a terrible decision is very high. Mm. So, you know, we deliberately have less transparency. We also, you know, as we're building positions, cutting positions, there's a lot of lack of transparency that it's built into. The lack of transparency and the lack of liquidity are two of the main drivers of our returns. Um, I think when you look at private investments, everybody understands the benefit of illiquidity now in real estate or in private equity because it's very hard to fire sale it in March. Same thing with our strategy. I mean, just because the underlying is liquid, you know, it doesn't mean that the behavioral dynamics are not still sources of return. So. There is like an element of, of uh, diminished disclosure being potentially a return driver, essentially, which is a little bit heretical right now. Um, on the other hand, you know, we were talking about narratives earlier. We are trying to really, like we, given that, we also don't want to have surprises, especially bad surprises. 
And so we're trying to really evaluate the portfolio from that perspective. We disclose all the major positions, the reasoning. And one of the things we like, we focus on a lot internally and we'll talk through with our partners is, it's not just where the allocation is, but we want to write out, you know, taking the Monte Carlo thing a, a step further, really trying to think about what are the potential future states for the world. Mm -hmm. And we need to write out right now what our plan is in those scenarios mm -hmm. for major variables, right. such as you know an oil shock. We had oil go negative. Oil could go completely the other way due to what you know Einar was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates, all these things, because you don't want a discretionary manager making those decisions in the heat of the moment, because mm -hmm. their cognitive ability, no matter how smart they are, is going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we talk through is what our plan is to react with the portfolio under different kind of macro regimes or regime shift situations. Um, and we do use kind of a hypothesis testing approach for our portfolio. We have, you know, these are the hypotheses we're testing when we have in the market. If these things get proven wrong or XYZ changes, these are the changes we're going to make to the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the basis for our risk management and, and, and trade management. Do you uh, provide those analyses to your investors? We provide some of them. Uh, I would say generally, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, if we have a, we're not going to walk through the exact trading plan for reposition. That's a, yep. A complicated issue, yep. <laughs> but for the general high level of the portfolio, um, yes. So you know, we really, I think, a lot of fundamental managers end up going down on their own sword. Our kind of one commitment to our investors is we're never going to be the guy that has half the portfolio in one thing and we keep shouting, "We're right, we're right, we're right." Everybody else is wrong, and then we're not right. You know, we really don't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but in terms of how we're going to respond to things like a coronavirus or an oil price shock or a yield shift or something like that or a massive short squeeze disaster like earlier this year, you know, at the beginning of this year, we just said, look, we're seeing a lot of things in, you know, the social media stuff we traffic, liquidity, uh, options market, et cetera, that, you know, I think the disclosure we put was, we see a high propensity for things to, quote, get weird. That's what we said. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we said, as a result of that, we're going to take gross in the portfolio way down below what we normally do, and we're going to take the short book way down. And if something shows up on any social media site, we're covering it immediately. Um, because we don't think that, you know, the market structure is going to work in the way people are going to expect it. And so we basically had a very boring spring when uh, a lot of my compatriots had a very unpleasant spring. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, my job is to not have negative surprises. And so a lot of these things that are these big hard calls that hedge funds are famous for making, I just like to go just kind of sit on the bench and have a Gatorade and watch everybody else play for a minute. And then I'll come back in and just play the fourth quarter, kick some field goals. I'm, I'm more of that type of guy. I like the layups. I'm there for the cocktail hour. <laughs> I'm not really here to like take the castle, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of discussions around that. And so one of the things I think is we will try to disclose enough information so that nothing we do is surprising. And we really want our partners to know us over a long period of time so that even if they don't know the specific trades we're doing, we want everything we do to be very consistent. And I think that's, that's the thing is if you're mm -hmm. going to invest in any vehicle where you don't have transparency, the yeah. main thing is looking at the consistency of the intellectual process and the investment process over time. And that's not, that doesn't mean the specifics are consistent, right? Yeah. So yeah. For, us, for us, it's about building that consistency, building that narrative there. Again, narratives. Um, and we disclose a lot of that stuff. And, and also we write you know, between eight and 20 page letters every quarter, kind of walking mm -hmm. through yeah. the major weights in the portfolio. But also just we write kind of a think piece on Here's what I see is going on in the world. Here's what I think is happening. Um, and I, I think we have a, we've got this great record of every quarter we write one of these. And we write something that seems a little weird. We're like, here's this thing that's happening on Twitter. And people are like, why is this relevant mm. to the world? And then six months later, they're like, oh, yeah, guy won the presidency with that stuff. I'm like, yeah. It was. So you know, we kind of try to have alignment on that stuff. But, um, and we do, we do, dis we do uh, you know, quarterly disclosures of overall allocations to sectors and long short and net exposure and gross leverage and things like that. But we don't run a very leveraged strategy. You know, we're usually 150% gross or something like that. We've tended to run like 30 to 60% net and usually we've been on the low end of that. So we're, we're, we tend to be for a hedge fund, fairly low leverage, fairly low net exposure, uh, very low correlation with the market. Uh, but we're not kind of like levering it up and trying to, like a lot of people are trying to take a lot, of, a lot of hedge fund products are trying to take intrinsically high volatility securities and use leverage and correlation games to end up with a low correlation, low volatility product. But they say they're doing that via fundamental stock selection. So they're like going to take all their risk from fundamental stock selection, jam it through a correlation bet when, with no understanding of correlation. And then everybody's surprised when these things blow up. Uh, so we just try to not 
we want to make sure we're not accidentally shifting all our weight into correlation. Most of that's just maintaining gross exposure for long short. I mean, a lot of times when, you, when somebody says they're a genius stock picker and you see the leverage above like 3x, it's not the stock picking. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would just add that transparency of process, I think, is equally as valuable on the ETF side. Right. Uh, for, for sure. So we, um, we, we at Simplify certainly try to do that as much as possible mm. and just have that conversation ahead of time um, so people are prepared. Right. And one thing I wanted to bring you in on, Dave, is, you know, one, I, I have taken a lot of pride in the fact that we have a lot of strong disagreements in our firm about where the market's heading, about what the dominant narrative is. And I think that that has ultimately informed our decision-making process when bringing products to market, um, specifically with regard to giving people building blocks and saying, okay, now you go and make the decision. You go put this together. How, obviously this has been a really integral part of the firm and the story of, of what we've done in about 12 months. How do you view that in terms of you know, building robust portfolios and, and focusing on you know, certain types of exposures and then making sure that you don't give someone something that they're gonna go and blow themselves up with? Yeah, I mean, obviously being risk managed is critical through the process. Um, but I, you know, for me, the most important thing to do when, when crafting new building blocks is to offer building blocks that are as orthogonal as possible to things um, that already exist, right? You know, you, you want to offer people diversifying return streams, um, alpha, beta, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, so just trying to be truly innovative and um, not taking on risks that people already can take, just offering new types of risk premia is really critical. Michael, I'll ask you, you know, you're running portfolios with tons of different types of clients. You know, obviously, they're going to all have different needs. Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying your best to kind of match this, I don't want to say one size fits all approach, but in a way, you have to be very deliberate about how you curate the menu mm -hmm. right? and make sure that people are getting what they need, but doing so in a way that doesn't drive you all crazy in terms of product development and, and user experience. Mm -hmm. When thinking about things like options or alternatives, right? Does that become very challenging for you all to say, you know, it's just not worth it? Um, I mean, it is a general challenge because I, I mean, I don't generally agree with that statement, right? Right. And it, it's always about risk and reward, right? And, um, you know, with alternatives, right? Like you have to endure the, you know, the illiquidity risk, right? To, to earn that premium, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's something that's very important to communicate to to um, to your clients, right? And like, oh, you're looking for these additional sources of return. Well, this is these are the risks you have to take, right? And um, really, the more challenging aspect of that is just being able to educate, right? And and um, because generally with tech products, uh, and I was saying this kind of off stage earlier, but like, honestly, like the more education you have to do, that's very highly correlated with a tech product not being successful, right? right? And so, um, so it is an interesting challenge for me. It's, I, I find it very engaging. I'm not necessarily sure if I'm gonna be successful, to be honest, but, um, but I think that, um, you know, to a certain extent, like, I think it's a responsible thing to do. And the one thing I can say for sure is just based on data we've seen, you know, at, at our company, like, we, we, you know, as you imagine, we, we, like any tech company, we track everything the user is doing, right? Unless they tell us not to, right? Um, but it's like, you see this, like, universe of investors where, like, you know, Betterment, got initial product market fit coming out of the great financial crisis, right? Just, and was able to just say like, look, here's your diversified portfolio. It's only this one. And you know, this was at, you know, at a time when like active was like, you know, very much uh, out of vogue and, you know, coming out of a great financial crisis, right? And, um, and so passive really, you know, became the story, right? 
And so, you know, Betterment got its initial product market fit uh, through those uh, through those means. But now that we're in these times of whether it's meme stocks, days of Robinhood, right? Days of you know being able to trade crypto, right? And, you know, it's it, it's changed, right? And now you have to really um, investors want that choice, right? And and as a fiduciary, you have to be able to find ways of giving them that choice in, in a way that's not going to blow up their portfolio and is still suitable for their, for their long-term goals, right? So, um, and so and oftentimes you land in a space where like, I have a baseline, whatever it is, 90, 10, 70, 30 portfolio, and we're gonna, you know, to, to reach this target level of return, I'm going to allocate X percent to uh, I mean, we do we do, uh, we do this nowadays as well. Like to, whether it's commodities, high yield, you know, high yield high yield bonds, uh, and um, um, so we do allow certain levels of flexibility. But I think I think we do have to get better at it and better at explaining it in, in general. So one thing I want to close with, you know, considering there there's been this theme of, of narratives that we've discussed the benchmarking effect that we're all beholden to, some of us more than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're generally playing in a, in a realm where we have to dance while the music is playing, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as we stop moving our feet, we run a, run a risk. Again, in the hedge fund world, you have a little bit of leeway when it comes to this. But I want to close with this, and, and I want to hear each of your thoughts. When you look around and you see the different dancers in the hall getting down to today's market vibes, who inspires you? What firm, what person? Uh, what is something that you think that we could take from, from that person and implore into an investment process? Dave? <laughs> My answer is simplify, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I love our, our DNA, our mission to innovate and break the shackles of the traditional approaches and spend tons of time and resources on educating and, and trying to push people, um, push the boundaries, push the boundary of the efficient frontier up and to the left, higher return, lower risk. Um, and, and at the core, you know, we're trying to fight that fight. We obviously know there's a balancing act with you know, behavioral optimality, um, but there's a, a lot of people just w willing to accept the status quo and, and not push the envelope. Uh, and I'm, I'm super proud and inspired by the whole team and Simplify that, that we do that every day. Well, that was a softball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dan? I also think Simplify. Thank you. You're uh, coming back. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, what I'm calling the O'Shaughnessy Expanded Cinematic Universe. So Patrick O'Shaughnessy has got the podcast. That's why the gym founded uh, Shaughnessy Asset Management, which I think is now Shaughnessy, Leg Mason, Franklin Templeton, and Friends or something. I don't know. They merged. We don't know what it is anymore, but um, it's something. They do a thing. Um, but I think what he's done, and then also he and, and Brent B. Shore uh, co-founded a business called Capital Camp, which has events. Uh, and then they've got a, a software, social, their own social network thing they're rolling out. I think the way he's built a media business, and I also, he also has a venture fund. Sorry, I'm forgetting uh, which businesses he has. But I think the way he's been able to build this uh, education media business around this podcast, which for years everybody said, why the hell are you doing this, uh, and build this massive audience, and more importantly, build this network of very uh, you know, amazingly smart people, and then cross it with in-person events, networking, and having you know increasingly almost any product somebody might want. Um, you know, I just think they're doing a lot of incredible stuff, and I think that the strategic move set they're building out uh, is, is tremendous. And so there's a lot of things that they do that I look at and wonder if, if I shouldn't be doing. And I also just think they're setting a great standard of kind of how to communicate with stakeholders, how to add value to stakeholders in a way that scales. Because I think that's really the issue is you know, one-on-one -on -one doesn't scale very well, and I think Patrick's found a real way to reach tens of thousands of people in a way that adds a lot of value, and he's finding different ways to monetize it. So I think that's a model everybody should study. Um, can I give multiple answers? <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. Um, so it's, I think, 
So I'm a little bit skewed towards the academic side, right? So like, um, so like Damodaran at, at the NYU Stern Business School. Uh, I mean, um, I really like his site a lot. I love the way that he does like very deep like analysis of individual stocks and companies, particularly at a time when pretty much you know everyone knows that everything's overvalued, but it's all relative, right? And so how how do I think through picking stocks? Uh, and so, like, I really, in the end, like, I enjoy hearing people like David Einhorn talking about this and kind of adjusting to this world where everything is is elevated in terms of valuation, and and then you just have to kind of adjust to this regime and 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 figure out um, what's still of of good value even even in in this kind of historically elevated world. Um, so, like, I I I really. At these days, I've been kind of grabbing on to, to, to the folks that, that, that do these really smart, like, um, you know, uh, equ equity company-specific analyses on, on, on cash flows. Um, and, and I think people who do that well uh, do continue to make money, for sure. Um, but beyond that, it's like I listen to, like, other podcasts, whether it's, um, whether it's Corey Hofstein, Meb Faber, and the guests they have on, on, on their shows, like the alpha architects of the world, that I find, you know, a lot of the approaches that these people take to be very compelling as well. Um, and so, um, and it's just a way of like thinking outside of the box. Not, you know, not everyone is, is, is probably prepared and has the domain expertise to be able to digest all that information, but, um, uh, but for me, it, it, it's kind of a source of, of new ideas as well. And um, shout out to Simplify as well, by the way. So anyway. Um, well, I appreciate all three answers. Yeah. And Michael, Dan, Dave, it's been a pleasure. For you all listening, thank you.